Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I also warmly welcome you to our conference here uh, at the center or at this uh, location. And it is a great pleasure for me to chair the first panel and introduce our four speakers this morning. We will begin our program, as uh, Professor Gebhardt already said, with a topic which is right at the heart of uh, the work that we are uh, doing here at the Kete Hamburger Center, the concept of legal cultures. And as a starting point for our conference in this first panel, we will take a closer look at the notion of legal culture from such different perspectives and view viewpoints as that of legal history, political theory and philosophy, sociology, and social anthropology. And this is rendered possible by the contributions from our esteemed uh, speakers that are here uh, with us this morning uh, who represent these, all these different viewpoints. Being a legal scholar myself, I'm particularly curious about this exchange across the disciplines since the concept of legal cultures is increasingly also referred to in the legal discourse. Though it is nothing that the mainstream uh, legal scholar would emerge him or herself into, uh, it is now uh, being used ever more often. Uh, and even our uh, uh, highest federal courts are now starting to, in the jurisprudence, to refer to uh, legal culture in very diverse uh, matters. However, uh, I fear that it is far from clear what uh, is meant by legal culture in that context. So I am really very curious and uh, that we are searching for this uh, question here this morning. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker, Professor Dr. Dietlef Tam, renowned legal historian from the University of Copenhagen. Professor for Danish legal history, European legal history, comparative law, and church law as well. And he is also head of the Center for Studies in Legal Culture at the Faculty of Law at the University of Copenhagen. Dietlef Tam pursued his legal studies in Copenhagen, Freiburg, and Paris. And he obtained his doctorate in legal history at the University of Copenhagen, as well as in philosophy at the University of Odense. Since uh, 1978, he is a full professor of legal history at the University of Copenhagen. He has been a visiting professor in Germany and Japan, and he is member of many distinguished academies all over the world, recipient of medals and awards, as well as an honorary doctor. The memberships and awards that were conferred upon him are so numerous that to list them here would rob us of too many, uh, too much uh, of our valuable time that we have to listen uh, to him and discuss his ideas. So I hope you will forgive me uh, by my abbreviation as well as my omission uh, to print, point out his extensive international publications, namely in the fields of Danish and European legal and political history. We are very much looking forward uh, to listen to you telling legal cultures, please. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and thank you especially for inviting us to this beautiful place, I think I can say. The old norm, I think, was uh, man kann über alles sprechen, nur nicht über 45 Minuten. I'll try to adjust to the new norm, done, uh, given to us probably by Anglo-Saxon effectiveness, that we should only talk for, <laughs> for a half an hour. The theme that's been given to me, and I think I can say so, is telling about legal cultures. And uh, I'll do that by starting with one of the more embarrassing scenes uh, in uh, European theatre, namely the first uh, scene of the fifth act of Shakespeare's Hamlet. Hamlet, as you will remember at this point, arrives back from England to Denmark, happy to escape from uh, the rather unpleasant fate that was foreseen for him by his uh, uncle in uh, England. 
his uncle who had bereft him of the Danish throne and he finds himself on a churchyard where two gravers are digging out the grave for his despised by him fiancée Ophelia. Ignorant of this destination of the grave, Hamlet jokes around with the skull stuck out and at a certain moment taking a skull in his hands pronounces the words this should have been a lawyer's skull followed by an eloquent fantasy of how the lawyer in case would have acted had he known that uh, he was thus being scuffled around the use by Shakespeare of terminology and examples taken from the legal world raises interesting questions as to the relation between Shakespeare and the law and uh, the lawyers of his time. Was he a lawyer? Did he have some legal training? Or did he just know what was the standard of what you might expect of an Elizabethan playmaker at uh, that time? These intriguing questions in themselves we will uh, leave out here. This is not our theme. But this metaphor of the lawyer's skull seems to be quite illustrative when it comes to the question, especially for lawyers and legal historians, what we mean when we talk of legal cultures. What is going on in the lawyer's skull is the reflection of a specific legal culture. David Nelkin, often mentioned in this connection in an article on human trafficking and legal culture, makes this useful, often discussed, especially by Cotterell and, uh, and Friedman, a distinction between the internal and external legal cultures. Internal legal culture, referring to the ideas and behavior of those within the law as lawyers, judges, even police. External legal culture, on the other hand, pointing to the pressures brought to bear on law from a wider society, including what ordinary people expect of the law and uh, whether or not they will trust legal institutions. Differences in external legal culture, such as the willingness to trust the police, clearly play an important role in explaining exactly this question of how those who are trafficked call for help on legal institutions. Legal cultures are subject to changes, to legal transplants, to cross-fertilization. They may be compared, and uh, only in a comparative context they are really meaningful. For instance, to characterize a legal culture like the Nordic culture as rather pragmatic as uh, we do and perhaps also rather cross, not too prone to accept legal pluralism in the sense of uh, <coughs> like other legal systems, uh, like religious systems and how they should coexist with the international law, that's only meaningful in a comparative uh, context. In the Nordic countries we often turn to the concept of deep structures to, as a name for those underlying concepts and traditions, basic political attitude, attitudes, social ideas, which mark the way in which we think of and uh, structure our law and uh, legal <coughs> institutions. Legal culture and legal cultures are profoundly influenced by these structures which we must dig out in order to understand the legal culture as we see it in action on the surface. As is well known and need no further mention. Legal culture is a broad and I think very useful way of summarizing what's going on both in the lawyer's skull and in the skull of non-lawyers when it comes to the law and uh, it uh, needs not be exactly the same. This leads me to the first word of the title of this presentation, the word to tell, which is in itself a word with many meanings. This presentation may therefore be a little ambiguous as is also the concept of legal cultures, which forms part of the title. The word tell stems from Old English tellen, related to Old Saxon tellen, meaning to tell or to count. 
In old high German we have a Zellen and in old Norse a Telia with the meaning of finding out, continuing, counting or summing up. In Danish and German Telle, Danish or Zellen, mostly has to do with numbers, whereas the English language has kept a lot of meanings to the word to tell. We care, it ranges from the detailed account of something that happened to mere enumeration. We can tell a story or the truth or make something known by telling a secret. We may give instructions by telling people what to do, persuade them by telling that something is good or the reverse. We can distinguish by telling that something is wrong, etc. Or we can let something bad tell us something good. We can tell the time by looking on the clock or we can just use telling for counting or talking which is what we are doing right now. It's all telling. So what happens when we tell legal cultures? We will not count them but rather tell or find out what this talking of legal cultures is about. I will thus tell about legal cultures with the aim of helping us to tell what it is about and I'll take the privilege presented by the title to do it my own way. Legal cultures and uh, legal culture are linked to the general question of legal culture as a professional culture. The legal culture of a professional lawyer has to do with conceptual elements, normative and methodological. Often you will link the method to the question of what we call legal sources, what the judge can take into account, and the questions of what can be, <coughs> what, how norms should be interpreted and how we should choose in case of conflicts of norm. The professional culture of a lawyer is, however, just one of several legal cultures. To such a legal culture belongs the ability to distinguish between Sein und Sollen understand systems like Kelsen's reine Rechtslehre basing itself in a hypothetical basic norm, a Grundnorm, or understand what the British heart means when he makes a distinction in his book The Concept of Law between primary and secondary rules and the basic rule of recognition. One kind of legal culture consists in having such concepts and methodological approach embedded in your professional behavior as a lawyer. Then the next ambiguity, culture or cultures. Are we talking of culture in general or do we point something different known as uh, cultures? Culture, as is well known, has to do with the cultura and way back in time linked to agriculture in modern sociology with ways of thinking or acting or the material <coughs> objects that form our life. Legal culture can refer to different ways of conflict resolution, uh, resolution or ways of disputing or much broader. It can refer to the many layers of consciousness that lie behind our way of handling the law. I have not seen it as my task today to give a final and in any way exact answer to the many questions raised by the putting together the three words telling legal cultures, but rather by referring to texts and examples I will tell why legal cultures, or perhaps even more exact the idea as it is here, Recht als Kultur must be considered a positive contribution to our traditional just finding the law. I'm very glad to participate in uh, the discussion here on this question. I'm myself, as was said, the director of a small center in our faculty in Copenhagen uh, <coughs> called uh, the Center for Legal Cultures. We have discussed uh, whether it should be rightly called Center for Legal Cultures. And we have discussed also what does it mean to be a center for legal culture and deliberately we have chosen not to be too exact and allow several approaches to the question. I will, as I said in this uh, presentation, outline what I see as important parts of what we can consider legal culture in a normative context. Lawyers are normally easy to identify 
as as a way of speaking a close language using words and concepts unknown to the general public or public school in other fields. An exception is Max Weber, who is justly honored at this particular center. Not only in his Reich Sociologie, but scattered all over his precious work, we meet the lawyer who can handle law and legal concepts and examples from the legal world. Just think of the Reich Honoratioren to clarify his thinking and build up new ways of looking at and understanding society. Nobody who has read him can doubt the importance of neither Roman law nor Roman lawyers two years, thousand years ago for the concept of rationality, nor the jurisprudence of the Qadi in Islam as representative of uh, an irration irrational type of justice centered on the case in hand. Precious tools were given by him for us to use what was the uh, <coughs> broad concept of the spirit of law. And this is my second hero, Montesquieu and his Esprit de Loi in the mid-century, 18th century, which were led uh, <coughs> to include a vast reading of much more than law books in the telling of what legal culture is. The world has moved forward since both Montesquieu and Weber, but uh, it's striking how often we look back on those two founding fig fathers when it comes to tell about legal cultures. And the third example I might include here is Egon Friedel, who is in his somewhat old-fashioned cultural history of the modern age from the 1920s, describes history as writing a kind of novels and seeing the good history as impossible, as a uh, good novel as impossible to pass when it comes to give the description of hi what history. And he calls his own uh, cultural history for the legend of our time, of modern time. Quite impressive. The ambiguity, the protean, changeable character of the, of the legal culture allows me to present one of my own favorites when it comes to the question of what we are actually doing when we dedicate ourselves to the study of law. Lawyers often have an ambiguous relation to their own fields. An example is the Italian Ludovico Antonio Muratori, who in 742 published his denouncement of all that was Italian law at uh, the time under the title Defetti della Giurisprudenza. One of his readers was a Danish uh, distant colleague of mine, the founder of Danish history in the 18th century, Peter Kofol Anker, who in 1764, 54 years old, published a small pamphlet with a title which can be rendered uh, in English as something like a letter to nobody on nothing in the field of law directed to an imaginary student of theology who had left theology and turned to the law. This might be the story of himself. He was educated in theology but changed to law himself after a law degree was introduced in Copenhagen in 1736. He tells this <coughs> new legal law student, you ask me, my dear friend, what I think of your having left theology in order to study law. And he says, you ask me, if you ask me for my opinion, you must not be angry when I say that I think you made a bad choice. The party is not equal. The study to which you have dedicated yourself is mostly nothing, and the fruit which you expect to harvest in time can easily turn out to be nothing. Allow me therefore this time to write you a letter which from the beginning to the end is nothing. And then it starts out natural law. I find it strange that this law shall have its basis in the nature of man mankind, which was always the same and which aims at pointing to a general road of happiness for us all, still barely 200 years old and is even built on such fine imaginations of the brain which only a few scholars have been able to understand. Either it must be reserved for a few very intelligent heads or it is nothing at all. Roman law, most of civil law is the science of words. 
meant to solve conflicts, instead it gives rise to conflict. And the practice of law, can you expect justice in those workshops known by the holy name of a law court? No. There is so much discussion of the law that what the case is about and what those who discuss persist before they will start discussing will all be nothing. Enough spoken of nothing, he says, what I've written, written, what I've written about, what I can further add, all is nothing. To write more would to be to do too much for nothing and waste my and try your patience on nothing. A rather discouraging way of uh, looking at the law, contrasting very much to what uh, the U.S. Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter wrote when he, in 1954, was asked by a young person how to prepare oneself for the study of law. Stuck your mind with much good reading. And I think this phrase can be a guideline for anybody choosing the law, even if lawyers today might find the view their field with higher respect and more appreciation than our colleague from the 18th century. It's still my conviction that the cultural approach to the law is instrumental in converting something that could be seen as nothing into something. Adding the cultural approach opens a wide range of possibilities to understand the law as much more than just imaginations, words and discussions, as our colleague in the 18th century described it. His solution was the reading of Montesquieu and L'Esprit des Lois. For him, it was essential to understand the law, and you'll see the way he did it on the other <coughs> Francis Biss of his book, 1769, on Danish law, in the roots we find the spirit of the law, in radices spiritus et vita, that's the way to, that's the way to do it. That could be a long story of the roots of Danish legal history, which is not what we will do, but we will change, go out on a little broader journey. I was in Ethiopia a few weeks ago, just when you travel around, you find people gathered, and when you ask what are they doing, they are discussing the law. Sitting just in front of you, you find people, two groups of uh, families, discussing the legal question that has arised, because uh, they have found out that uh, two young, a young couple just married were too near in, uh, <coughs> nearly uh, related to each other. How shall we do it? They were discussing, we must find out ourselves, we shall not go to the real courts, we shall not go to the traditional law, and as you might know, Ethiopia is a country in which this question of the, of the formal law and traditional law is a high issue at the moment. During the reign of Haile Selassie in 1962 by Rony David, there was made a code for Ethiopia based to a high degree on the French civil code, some customary law, uh, <coughs> and there is a formal system of law, but that is very important customary law. This is, I think, today one of the more <coughs> important issues within legal cultures, that is the clash between traditional culture and, uh, <coughs> the, uh, and the, the system. If that had been real so three quarters of time, I would have dug very much into the, the example also of India, Thomas Macaulay, known for his British history, and the author of an Indian Penal Code, 1837, which came into force in 1860, of which it was said by Stephen, the great criminalist, that it introduces in a concise and evil, beautiful form the spirit of the law of England, and in, in a compass by which, by comparison with the original, may be regarded as almost absurdly small. It's to the French Code Penal and to the German Code of 1800, and <coughs> what a finished picture is to sketch. And what does uh, modern uh, <coughs> Indian lawyer says, the Manuadis have good reasons for hating Lord Macaulay. It's a fact that the India Penal Court that Macaulay drafted 1837 is not Indian. Fantastic uh, clash. And exactly the same discussion as you will hear in uh, Ethiopia on the two cultures which are, have been met 
A third example of how such a clash come in and how it's mediated is the discipline of the derecho indiano, the way uh, in which uh, colonial law is started in uh, Latin America. The big classic within that field is, uh, is a wonderful book written by Juan Solorzano de Pereira uh, in the first half of the 7th century. If uh, we could see this, we would see the Spanish kings sitting on the world with America and, uh, and Spain and America on the same level. That's what's so interesting in the derecho. Uh, that basically America and Spain forms part of the same corps. We'll see uh, Fides and we'll see religion, uh, religio, and uh, we'll see this beautiful metaphor which I like so much that we should be like the bees always be on our way and uh, and studying but a very interesting example of how and an <coughs> clashes of culture is trying to be <coughs> reconciliated by putting them into one discipline the derecho uh, the derecho indiana and uh, an example of legal culture from my own country, 1241, we date uh, an important medieval Danish law of, uh, of Jutland. For many years, uh, what was considered the oldest manuscript was kept in a library in Stockholm, and to the great pride of Denmark, this came back in 2011 and was celebrated. The law of Jutland returns from Sweden. So here yeah, again, even in a modern country, an example of how ideas of continuity, simplicity, uh, the way uh, of, uh, of a law which corresponds to society is seen still as a precious pearl within uh, within the legal within legal culture. In 1941, during the German occupation, such uh, <coughs> such a. Uh, Posters were made celebrating the idea of the law of Jutland as the old, the order of law against what could happen in a in a war when a, when a country was uh, in a country was uh, was uh, occupied. Even on uh, the Danish <coughs> municipal court, as we all know, one of the interesting examples of what a legal culture could be is looking at architecture, looking at the houses of the law. This is a rather weak point, I would say, in most Nordic countries, especially in Denmark, in which we tr try to be modest, but at least the municipal court in Copenhagen, with this phrase, on the, <coughs> on the law, the la the, upon the law, the land shall be built, which is the first phrase from the law of, uh, of Jutland, serves so like a general motto for justice and, uh, and legal culture in, uh, in Denmark, very far from the more bombastic way in which it's done. If you enter the United States Supreme Court uh, court hall, you'll find uh, freezes on the right and freezes on the west, which uh, will take you back to old Egypt to the King Minas, him Hammurabi Solomon, the Greek lawyers Lycurgus Solon and Drac Dracon, Augustus and Justinian, all are lined up, including also Moses, even Muhammad is there with his uh, Quran and Confucius, Charles Emmanuel, Lackland, St. Louis, Grotius, Blackstone, Chief Justice Marshall, who was the man who introduced uh, the Legal Review, and, uh, and Napoleon. Napoleon was also one of the heroes when it comes so, to this uh, <coughs> whole uh, combination of culture and law and uh, on his tomb, you know, the, you go down in the, <coughs> in the Dome de saint Valide, there are all these uh, reliefs on the sides and one of them, we see him uh, substituting the old law, we see the old man coming with the customary law, being substituted by the new fresh code civil, which should now be the, by be the governing, uh, the, the French, uh, be the uh, French uh, law. Telling legal, cult <coughs> legal culture is a very broad field, and uh, how broad such a field can be without losing borders and becoming meaningless is of course one of the questions we have to discuss. I would have liked to include also the question of law and literature. What can Antigone, Shylock, 
Michael Colhas, Billy Board or Meursault, tell <coughs> the Camus Meursault, not the wine, tell us uh, about the law and uh, normativity. Those of us who have given courses of law and literature knows that they can tell us quite a lot. Normandy is the heart of the plot of Antigone. Billy Bard is hanged due to strict keeping up of a norm that leaves the reader in doubt as to whether that this was really what was meant by the norm. Telling legal cultures could imply telling many lessons to be learned from the good reading recommended by Justice Frankfurter. Law is about words, but it is not as the Nordic Prince Hamlet suggests, or our Danish colleague from the 18th century complain, it's not just words, words, words. I'll come to the conclusion. And uh, in a conclusion, I would have been happy, but I think it would be brief brevity, which is another beautiful quotation from Hamlet, brevity is the heart of wit. Brevity will uh, ask me to include a few, only a very few words, just uh, mentioning that legal cultures for a lawyer, of course, is quite a lot the question of what is the Nordic legal culture compared to continental legal culture on an Anglo-Saxon not to speak of the India, Ethiopian or, or Latin American examples which I've tried just to suggest here as, uh, as these uh, examples uh, typical for the legal culture of, uh, of my country is probably that it's a very new legal culture professionalization of, uh, of lawyers only started in the 18th century and only from about 1800 we can count of the law being actually carried out by professional lawyers. From the outside, the Nordic countries may look at an homogeneous group, and they are also, but there are also important differences. Uh, they are egalitarian societies with a close past as mainly rural societies, with the urban societies as places basically for a bourgeoisie and intellectual elite. The state is held high and often you cannot distinguish between what's done by civil society and what's done by what's done by uh, the state as to responsibility as the responsibility it's a pragmatic legal culture culture we have a work going on on harmonizing le <coughs> the nordic law for uh, many uh, for many years the law is probably more what you would call civil law than common law but has its own way of doing things, which uh, <coughs> makes us consider Nordic law as its own family when you use that kind of, uh, that kind of terminology. Law Nordic lawyers will often feel that they have a similar approach to the law and share the same cultural values. And there we will stop and legal culture teaches us what that law is more than words. It's actually in itself a culture, Recht als Kultur. I've tried here to present some of my personal approaches to the law as culture and legal culture. Seeing the law as culture may not be the way all lawyers are seeing it, but it definitely saves us from the tedium of the Danish law professor in the, who in 1764 wrote to no one about nothing in the law. I'm afraid it's not a coherent story of legal cultures, and I think that's what makes this story so fascinating, that there are many stories to tell, but none of them is the story. That leads me to this last picture, which is the very newest contribution of Danish art to the question of what is justice. Jürgen Haugen Sørensen is the name of a now 80 years old uh, Danish sculptor and painter, well known with us, who just made uh, a new decoration for a courtroom in the municipal court of Copenhagen, which we saw with the inscription on the law to land to be built upon the law. This figure he calls not Justitia, but Justitio. Let's end there. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.